A quick art montage is shown on screen. At Home with the DIA presents Behind the Scene in Our Own Voice, African American Art. A PowerPoint presenter and American Sign Language interpreter appear on screen. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today to learn a little bit more about the African American art that is in the DIA's collection. So today we're going to talk about um, about 20 objects and see what we can learn about this, and then you will be able to see them when you go to the museum, most of them. So first I wanna say that this art, uh, the DIA was the first museum in the US to have a dedicated curator and a dedicated um, center for African-American art. And so these are pieces that you see here, some were acquired before that, but since 2000, so for 20 years, we've had a separate center and uh, to purchase art and to display art by African-American artists. New slide shows a landscape painting. So the first, uh, the first one we'll talk about is Ellen's Isle, La Catrine. This is from 1871 by Robert Scott Duncanson. His father was Scottish. His mother was African-American. So he went back and forth between the two countries, primarily self-taught. And he actually was born in 1821, a free man. He lived in Detroit and also in Cincinnati, and he's buried in Monroe in his family cemetery. This um, is a real place, and he was inspired to do this work by Walt, uh, Sir Walter Scott's poem, The Lady of the Lake. He was in his time one of the most famous landscape painters in the U.S. New slide shows a brown and black sofa. This sofa is by Thomas Day. Thomas Day, also African-American man who lived in North Carolina. His father was a cabinet maker, and he took that another step further and became a furniture maker. He would actually have a catalog that people could choose styles and could choose upholstery with. The upholstery is horsehair. That upholstery has been replaced, but the furniture is exactly the same. This was made in about 1840. And the furniture very rarely comes up for sale because it's passed down through the families. So this sofa is hanging actually right below the Duncanson painting. New slide shows two bust sculptures in white. In the same room, we have two little busts. These are about 18 inches tall from, uh, of Minnehaha and Hiawatha. Edmonia Lewis, the artist, uh, these are in marble. Edmonia Lewis, uh, her mother was Ojibwa. His fa her father was African-American. And of course, she wanted to be a sculptor from when she was a little girl and was told she couldn't be because she was Native American, because she was African-American, and because she was a woman. So she actually ended up going to Rome and working in Italy her entire career because there no one had a problem teaching her how to sculpt. So she had a long career in Italy. You can see that um, she did this in Rome. She did these pieces in Rome in 1868. And notice that, uh, that uh, Minnehaha has a pearl necklace and also a ruched top of her dress, very gathered, and that's the European style of the time. So even though she's doing a Native American woman, she's very much influenced by European styles. New slide shows a landscape painting. This is a piece by Henry Asawa Tanner, uh, Tanner, I'm sorry, from 1899. This is called Flight into Egypt. And um, what he is uh, evoking here are Jesus, Mary, and Joseph when they fled to Egypt. But he also may have had in mind the Northern migration of African-American people to the North um, post-Civil War when they had a lot of difficulties uh, after the federal troops left. So you can see that the style is quite impressionistic. Uh, Tanner also went to Paris to study with the impressionists. And so he's acquired some of that style. New slide shows a portrait photograph. This is actually a photograph um, by Prentice Polk, who was a professional photographer. This is a photograph of his wife, Margaret Blanche Polk, from 1928. 
the Polks were uh, a, quite a power couple at Tuskegee Institute. Um, Polk was, a, was, like I said, a professional photographer, but Margaret um, was a physical therapist. She ran a restaurant and she also, um, they had children who all of them had wonderfully successful lives in education, activism, and in healthcare. So they were quite a power couple, and this is just such a beautiful photograph. New slide shows a metallic-looking brown bust. This is a little bust. It's about uh, two feet tall, and it's Gammon. Um, it's the nephew of Augusta Savage, the artist, from about 1930. Augusta Savage um, actually did portraits of Harlem Renaissance leaders like W.E.D. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, but she also sculpted. This looks like bronze, but it's actually um, painted plaster. And the reason that it's painted plaster is because that's less expensive than doing the bronze. So there is another uh, depiction of this little boy, the same one, a little bit larger, that is in bronze, that's in MoMA's collection in New York. So this was kind of the trial one. New slide shows a black and white painting, 1983. This is Roland Hayes, who is an opera singer, became a very famous uh, opera singer. And he heard a recording of Enrico Caruso when he was 12. He was the son of sharecroppers, so he had never seen an opera. He had never heard an opera until he heard Enrico Caruso and decided he wanted to do that. And so he started singing in church and then went on, continued on, and his talent was recognized, and he became very famous uh, as an opera singer, sang with many, a uh, Boston Symphony and many other of the famous orchestras. This looks like a photograph, but it's actually a painting in black and white. Reginald Gammon was part of a group called The Spiral, and they focused on black and white paintings. New slide shows an oil painting, 1950 to 51. This is um, Art of the Negro. It's, a, it's an oil painting, but it's um, made by Hale, Hale Woodruff as a study for a very large mural that's in the library at Clark Atlanta University in Georgia. And it depicts 17 famous African-Americans um, from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. So, um, and we have a pullout panel in front of it that tells who all the people are. Um, so, can I, uh, shall I say who the people are now? Okay, we can do that. All right, so if we look at the back row and we start on the left, we have Henry Asawa Tanner, the artist. Next to him is Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist. We have Booker T. Washington, the political activist and educator. Uh, John Hope, who is an educator. In the middle, uh, Langston Hughes, the poet, novelist, and playwright. Uh, the next person with the red vest on is Denmark Vesey, leader of a slave insurrection. Sojourner Truth, the abolitionist. W.E.B. Du Bois, civil rights activist. And Henry Bibb, who is a writer. In the middle row, we have in the white cap, Phyllis Wheatley, a poet, County Cullen, another poet, Marian Anderson, the singer, Reverend Richard Allen, a very quite a famous preacher, Adam Clayton Powell, a politician, and George Washington Carver, um, a scientist in the middle with the plant. And then at the bottom, we have on, with the, uh, the gold jacket, Benjamin Banneker, a scientist. And on the other side, Joshua Jordan, who, uh, Joshua Johnson, I'm sorry, who was an artist. So these are the figures that are identified. And then these are the ones that are much larger on the library mural. New slide shows a photograph, couple in raccoon coats, 1932. So here we have another photograph by another famous African-American photographer, James Van Der Zee who had a studio in Harlem for over 50 years. And he would be very concerned with props and how he was posing people and what they were wearing. And he said later about his photographs, I think they were more important to me than the people in the photographs because he spent so much care getting everything just right. So very, very wonderful photographer. New slides show a compilation of colorful screen prints. 
This is one of the screen prints from the John Brown series by Jacob Lawrence. And I'm going to show you the next slide, which has more of them. So these are really so contemporary. These were done in uh, the 1970s, 1974, but they look like today's graphic novels. They're really telling a wonderful uh, story in very simple drawings. This is the story of John Brown, who led the uprising pre-Civil War on Harper's Ferry. It was a federal ammunition dump. The problem is, of course, that John Brown only had 22 people with him. And so it's very hard. He was a very committed abolitionist, but it was very hard to do anything with 22 people. So he actually ended up getting caught um, by the government uh, and was hanged for treason. Now, this was before the Civil War. This is um, in 1859. And because people said later, why would you execute someone for being against the enslavement of people? that actually galvanized more people to supporting the Civil War um, because everyone thought it was wrong that that should happen. The way that we have this in the DIA is we have all 22 of the images right in front of it, right in front of it. And then we only have three pr uh, prints up at the same time because they're fragile. But you always can know the whole story underneath. New slide shows a painting of a boy in 1953. This is um, a work by Huey Lee Smith, um, the piper, about a little boy who's playing his recorder. And this is very interesting. When we, when we show this to adults, the adults say, well, it looks like the building's falling down. But when we show it to children, they will often say, it looks like the building isn't finished yet. So it's a very different, um, very different uh, impression with children and adults. And you can see this little boy is very focused on his recorder. Um, this painting actually was in a contest at the DIA and won a prize, a uh, top prize. And then the DIA purchased this painting from the artist. New slide shows so. a textured round art piece, 1988. Um, autobiography, a ARCS 560. This is the term for tear gas. And Howardina Pindell um, is from Pennsylvania, and she learned that tear gas is made in Pennsylvania near where she lives. And so she was really upset about this. So she made this piece. It's quite large. It's almost five feet by five feet. And she's taken headlines from different newspapers and really made it like a crime scene. She's used her own body as a tracing for the three figures that you see on, this, on the image. And she's also used strips of cloth as if they were wounds that were healing. So actually it's very textural as well. New slide shows a portrait painting, 1995. This is a portrait of Christopher Fisher, um, who was a skinhead. And he actually was convicted in um, 1993 of conspiring to ignite a race war. He was, con uh, he was planning the bombing of the first African Methodist Episcopal Church in Los Angeles. And uh, so he was convicted. He went to prison. And Peter Williams has portrayed him as ugly as all the thoughts that he had and all the plans that he had. And so he said, the, what, could, what would happen to you if you woke up looking like all the terrible things you were thinking and the terrible things you were planning? And so this is the... Um, this is the purpose of this painting, just to show that. New slide shows a sculpture, 1990. Here is a work by Tyree Guyton. Of course, we know his name from the Heidelberg Project in Detroit, the series of houses that he um, has, de has um, worked on. And what he's talking about with caged brain is that as we get older, we, don't, we aren't as creative as we were as children. And we kind of don't think of things anyway as, um, as exciting or exploring. Uh, we kind of close our brains. Maybe that's because we have mortgage payments and car payments. I don't know. But he, does, he wants us to think more like children and be open to things, open to ideas. New slide shows a dark framed artwork. Beyond Midnight is a work by Betty Saar um, from 2002. What Betty Saar is doing is she is working with symbols. This is a collage, so she has a lot of different symbols evoking um, 
the rituals that African American women uh, or women in Africa bring with them, have brought with them, and that they still practice. And, um, and she's also referring to the habit of some African Americans to call each other names based on skin color. And so she's saying beyond midnight, beyond color of the skin, let's, you know, let's get ourselves together and get past that. And it's really amazing the imagery she's used with the, um, the different amulets and the different pieces she's attached. New slide shows a sculpture, Blood, Sweat, Tears, 2005. This is a work by Allison Saar, who's Betty's daughter. And she actually, um, she actually uh, made this piece because she was thinking about her father. Um, her father was a conservationist. Her mother was the artist. And her father taught her how to work with recycled materials. And so what you see here is you see um, a wood carving that Allison used her own body as the model for. And so after the wood was carved, she then attaches to it these little copper squares. And then over the copper squares, she has bronze tears. And the tears go all the way around, also on the back of the figure. And I, so I think this really is such a visual expression of grief and of sadness and her feelings after her father died. And this is when she made this piece. New slide shows a portrait, 1989. Here's the work that's almost full size by Benny Andrews. And it's called Portrait of Ecologist. And this is interesting because the collar, the sleeve of his shirt, and the pant leg are all real. They're all fabric. So it's part painting and part collage. And... Um, and then he also has in the box on the floor, on the, uh, on the left, he has also some real rags, real cloths. So he's showing you what an artist would use, but he's also showing you um, real fabric and real pant legs. So this is all, the, this is really a beautiful painting. He, um, uh, Benny Andrews was one of 10 children from a sharecropper family, very poor. And he left Georgia at age 28 to go to New York to be an artist. So he was very concerned with um, museums and galleries not showing enough art from African-American people and women. So he was very uh, involved with that to try to get um, more exposure for African-American and women artists. New slide shows a beaded necklace, 1993. Flaming Skeleton is by Joyce Scott. And Joyce Scott um, is a very interesting person. She is from Scottish and African-American um, families. And in her, and also Native American, and among her family were storytellers, artists, quilters, and basket makers. So she comes to her craft. This is a necklace. But actually, she comes to it from a lot of different ways. You see the yin and yang, the Chinese symbol. We see skeletons, um, more symbolism there. She actually um, was called the queen of beadwork. And so she does a lot of this, um, the day of the dead symbolism with the skeletons and also the, the yin and yang of the balance of life. So this is quite a beautiful piece. New slide shows a clay head art piece, 1960. The head by Elizabeth Catlett looks like it's carved wood, but actually it's clay, terracotta. And Elizabeth Catlett uh, focused on imagery of African-American and Native Mexican, Indigenous Mexican women. And um, so she actually um, married a Mexican artist and lived in Mexico from 1947 until 2012 when she died. She worked also with uh, Diego Rivera. So she's picked up a little bit of his style. And she actually was the first female sculptor professor at the University of Mexico. So we have several other works by hers in the gallery. New slide shows a mural piece, 1984. This is a very large depiction by Charles McGee who is in his 90s, still making art in Detroit. Uh, he has a bunch of people. Use, I, mean, I know everyone has probably seen his pieces on the lawn uh, at the Rackham building opposite the DIA. And he has a new piece 
uh, between and the plaza between the African American Museum and the Science Center. So he has uh, pieces in hospitals. His work is at Beaumont Hospital and also Henry Ford Hospital. So his work, and also one of the people mover uh, stations has a Charles McGee mural. And what this is depicting, Noah's Ark, this is, um, this is uh, putting together a lot of different ideas to highlight um, the great flood of the, uh, in the Bible uh, caused Noah's, Noah's Ark to be famous as a story. But also he's talking about his optimism and belief that people can overcome disruption and re rebellion and come together. So this is a beautiful piece. He has some uh, fabric here that's made by the women of Mali. He also has sheet music. He has rope. And he also, you might notice, there's a little black dot um, just slightly to the right of the middle. And that little black dot is the dead bumblebee. And so, of course, when he finished the piece and it came to the DIA, people said, what is the meaning of the bumblebee? And Charles McGee said, it has no meaning. The paint was wet and the bee flew into the paint and I left it there. So it's a real bee. <laughs> New slide shows glass artwork of people gathered together. This is an artwork by uh, Ramir Bearden called Quilting Time. This was commissioned by the DIA in 1985 for the DIA's 100th anniversary. And what it's depicting are uh, remembrances of Ramir Bearden's summers in North Carolina. When the family came together, you can see that there's quilting going on, but there's also music and uh, family members and a picnic basket. So he's really looking at family getting together and, and recognizing each other and enjoying each other's company. And this is actually made of a glass tile called tesserae. And this tesserae is made in Italy. So what Ramir Bearden did was make a maquette, a paper model of it, life-size, and then brought it to Italy. And the Italian glass artists then made the, uh, the tiles in the colors that he specified. And this is on the second floor, right next to the Farnsworth elevator. So this is really, um, this is in a, a, it, it takes up its own wall. It's really a huge piece. New slide shows a painting of a man with a horse and sword, 2007. And so our last work, Officer of the Hussars, this is a work by Kehinda Wiley. And um, what he does, um, as he explains it, he asks people on the street that he encounters, would you like to pose for me? And he said, most people say no. But if you, um, if you do want to pose for him, he will show you a book of famous paintings. And you may choose how you would like to be depicted. So this young man chose Officer of the Hussars. And uh, he chose that because uh, he said, you shouldn't have to be president or general to be, uh, or king and queen to be in a museum. So this young man chose Officer of the Sars by the same name from 1812 by Theodore Jericho. And this is a painting that's at the Louvre in Paris. And so uh, the only thing different about this, the horse is the same, the, um, the, the saddle, the leopard saddle blanket is the same. The only thing different about this is it's a young black man and not the white general who's in the original painting, but it elevates. And of course, Kehinda Wiley is the same artist who painted the portrait of President Obama for the National Gallery. And that was unveiled in February of uh, 2018. Detroit Institute of Arts logo rolls across the screen. Video fades to black.